it isn't just you say, what, what are the things we want to do right now? It's what are the, what's the order in which you develop the direction for an organization, okay? The first thing you do uh, is you're trying to get the team, your team on the same sheet of paper. In other words, you're trying to get it so that everyone on your team looks like, here's where we're going this year. This is where we're going this year. You're trying to get everyone to think about it the same on your whole team. So there's not a lot of conflicting and banging into each other. But everyone is in agreement. And redu reducing the team's miscommunication, where I thought you were going to do that, why well, I thought, you know, that. And so the first thing you do in developing a, a annual plan, and we're talking about an annual plan now, that's actually very strategic in its thinking and tied to the, what we've just covered in the last session, the strategic plan. When you start a church or any kind of organization, a part of what you're looking at is what makes me or us weep or pound the table. So your number one question is, what makes me weep or pound the table? Here's what that means. As I think about what's going on in our community, or our world, or something, I can't think about it without getting tears in my eyes and without weeping. In other words, I feel deeply about this. That's your number one question. Or what gets you angry? You say, something has got to be done about this. Make a list of those things. In our town, this makes me weep, or this makes me pound the table. Getting an understanding of what makes you weep or pound the table is the start of your, of your annual plan. Because this year, we've got to do something about that. The next thing is your purpose statement. You put your purpose statement down so that everyone who is looking at the annual plan can bring in the purpose statement from your strategic plan, your long-term plan. And then what you do, and this, is, this gets interesting in that you're looking at your objectives, which are your up to seven areas that are the general categories of activity within a church or within an organization. Let me jump ahead just a little bit to say that um, I'm going to draw a quick look at an organizational chart for you. You've got a board typically in an organization. You've probably got a board. Then you've got a senior executive. In other words, that may be you as the president or the executive director. Then you've got someone in charge of administrative services. That's the accounting and bookkeeping, the facilities, the, H the HR, the IT, the human resources, the, you know, uh, the uh, computer system, those kind of things. You've got someone who is administratively oriented to, to handle that. Then you've got someone over here who is communication system. Now, let me stop here to say I don't, I don't assume you have all these people. What I assume is you have all these responsibilities if it's just you. Someone has to be responsible for these, even if it's just you. And then you have down here, uh, like, let me illustrate it with a church. You have four areas of responsibility. And they're the same in every church, regardless of what you call them. You've got Christian education. In other words, you've got to have someone that's teaching the Sunday school classes or that kind of thing, taking care of the nursery. Then you've got missions and outreach. Every church should have missions and outreach, whether it's foreign missions or local missions or whatever that is. Then you've got pastoral care. This is like uh, pastoral counseling. This is caring for the hospital, invalids, or that kind of thing. And then you've got uh, worship and music, which is the Sunday service, etc. These four functions are in a church, again, regardless of you've got someone responsible for them. The day you start a church, you're responsible for all these. And then as you build an organization, whether it's paid or unpaid, you basically ask someone to be responsible for that area. So in an organization, you have those basic functions. Now in a nonprofit, you have the board, the senior executive, administrative services, communication services, and then down here you may have various programs. They, they wouldn't be these, but you'd say, we have a program to this and this and this. Now, what I'm saying here, the reason I'm drawing this now, we'll talk more about this later, the reason I'm drawing it now is these are the objective areas of your church. In other words, on, the, on this sheet, you're saying, okay, what are the areas in our church that will stay there for the next 20 years? And like, but this year, what are those areas? Well, we have somewhat, the board has certain things they need to do this year, and the senior executive has things that, that need to be done this year. 
and administrative services, there are some things that need to be done this year, and in communications, and in these various areas. So you break, the, break your annual plan into these basic categories, okay? That is your basic focus for the year. You got needs, purpose, and objectives. Now some people call objective what's measurable. Some people call objectives as not measurable. I tend to call it not measurable. And there's objectives are not measurable, they're categories of activity. That's why I describe it here, the way I describe it here. Then once you've got that set up, you've got basically your focus for the year. You've got your needs, your purpose, your objectives. Then each of these, you go back to the left side of the arrow and say, all right, in this area, what have been the milestones last year? Administrative, what were the milestones last year? That's your, your first column on the left side. One of the things that you want to do is you want to see that nothing motivates like results. Nothing motivates like results. Goals don't, prior, you know. It's like nothing motivates like seeing it actually happen. So what you want to do is you ask each of these people what, uh, what actually worked last year? What, what milestones did we cover? And it's exciting to hear it and to see it and to read it, depending on how you ask them and present it. And then you say, okay, if this, those have been the milestones for each area, what are the ideas you've got for next year in each of these areas? This is how you put together a plan for where are we going next year. What are the ideas you've got for what you might do? The next one is roadblocks. What are the three things holding you back? In, in this area, what are the three things holding you back in administrative services? And then the other one is, what are the three greatest resources you have in administrative services? They could be a person, they could be our computers, really helpful. They could be, what are the resources you've got that are really helpful to you? So you've got the general category of needs, purpose, objectives. Then you've got over here the milestones for each of those areas, the uh, ideas for each of those areas, the uh, roadblocks for each of those areas, and the uh, resource for each of those areas. Now you're ready to plan. There's, that's the context for the year for each of those areas. And then you look and you say, okay, in the next 90 days, if each of these, if, if in Christian education, if in the next 90 days you could accomplish only three things that are measurable, so we could get, and, and this is the real key concept, that it's measurable. It isn't, well, to do the best we can with children. That's not it. It's like, what three measurable things will you get done? You say, Bob, are you a measurability freak? Everything has to be measurable. I say, you know what, the most important things in life are not measurable at all love of a mother, love of a child, you know, love for Christ, those aren't measurable. You don't even try to measure them. But when you're leading and you're trying to figure out what are they doing and they're trying to figure out did I get it done, measurability is critical. Because two things. Number one, it forces you to clarify what do I really want them to do. That's important because if you don't know what you want them to do, how are they supposed to know? And it forces them to be clear on what they're supposed to do, and it forces you to communicate clearly as to are we making the same basic assumption about am I assuming what you're supposed to do and you're assuming what you're supposed to do the same thing. Now here you get into style. Do you set what's supposed to be done and say here's what you're supposed to do? Or do you say every one of you come up with the three things that you want to do that you feel are measurable, that you feel are the top three priorities for the next, next quarter? Or do you each come up with it and compare notes? That's style. It doesn't matter. If you're a high control person and say, this is what I want you to do, here are the three things I want done, there's, not, there's no sin in that. On the other hand, if you say, I want them to be involved, and I'd like them to decide what three things are important to get done that are measurable. And you come up with that, and I'll review it and refine it and approve it. If I like it, or I'll change it a little bit. That's all right. That's, there's no sin in that. Or if you say, look, you come up with three, I'll come up with three, and let's see if we're together. There's no, nothing wrong in that. So it depends on your style, the maturity of your team, etc. 
But what you want to do is at the end, you want to make sure that both of you are in agreement as to what three things need to be done in each of these kind of boxes. And then you look and you say, all right, short range. And here again, there is no zero that I've ever found anywhere a standard definition of short, mid, and long range goals, or short, mid, and long range priorities, I should have said. Because some organizations see a short range priority as a year. Mid range is two years. Long range is three years. There's nothing wrong with that. If that's the way your thinking goes in your team. Other people say, well, short range is a year, mid range is three years, and long range is five to 10 years. Nothing wrong with that if that's where your thinking goes. I'm saying a lot of times in our, in our assumption is that other people have got a standard in planning that we don't know about. It's not true. There is no standard. I've worked with 500 different organizations over the last 42 years. There is no standard that I've ever seen in 500 organizations. So what you want to do is say, okay, on our team, what do we, what's realistic for us to think of in terms of, all right, 90 days, everyone agrees. That's sort of a real good planning time for phase, you know, the first thing. Number eight on your chart. But the next one, often people say, well, I think a year is good. You know, mid, uh, short range is a year. And then mid range, I think for us two years would be good. And longer range would be three years. I think that's the most common time frame I've seen people take. I'd like to share with you the meaning of the word priorities. If you're going along here, or one of your staff is going along here, and you've all got a dream of the difference you would hope to make someday. Like, our organization exists to do this. We really want to change this. Here's why we're here. You have a common dream. But a lot of writers or authors would say, you've got to have goals or how are you going to be a leader? Wrong. If you don't have goals, how are people going to know what you're going to do? Wrong. About 15% of all the people you'll ever meet in your life, adults you'll ever meet or lead, about 15% feel like it's critical to get to that dream. We have to have short, mid, and long range goals. They're goal oriented. Their nature, their, how they normally think about things are goals. That's about 15% of the adult leaders I've ever met. So does that mean 85% can't lead? No. We've had presidents of countries in all three of these categories. Some people say, I hate setting goals. I, it's not that I don't like it. I hate it. I just don't like goals, period. Don't ever talk to me about goals. I say, I've got some good news for you. 80% of the people you'll ever meet would much prefer solving problems than setting goals. And it's all right to do that. That's 85, 80 percent of the people would they're problem solvers, not goal setters. But the, the good part of priorities is that all three of these are priorities, and they're all measurable. And the goal is something we add, add it. Or a goal is like, we're going to add a wing to this building. We're going to add seven staff people this year. We're going to add a new computer system. We're going to, anything you're going to add is a goal. Problem solvers are much more fix it. We've got a problem with the plumbing. We've got a problem with the roof. It's leaking. Uh, here's what we need to fix this year to keep going. We've got a problem with our parking lot. We've got a problem with our nursery. We've got a problem with, in other words, it's seeing a problem, spotting a problem, and fixing it. You know what? That's just as important as adding something. Goal setters, I hate to, hate to disappoint you. You're not the only people in the world. Problem solvers are just as effective at leading. They just lead differently than you do. But 5% of the people say, you know what? I don't like setting goals. You know what? I don't like solving problems. 
What I like is going to sleep until an opportunity comes up and say, where's the opportunity? Oh, uh, you know. And so 5% of the people would like to skip problems, skip goals, and come over here to something that would be an opportunity. That's 5% of the people, which add it, fix it, grab it while it's here. And grab it is not a bad term. It's like there is an opportunity come up to buy the property next door. We thought it was never going to be for sale because the old man wouldn't sell it. But he died, and his son came to us and said, how would you like to buy it for half the price? If you don't take it by Thursday, we're going to sell it to people on the other side. That's opportunity. Mm -hmm. To accelerate, the, the word tied to opportunity is acceleration. It's that it will accelerate at a level we could never have dreamed of if we grab that opportunity now. Now, that doesn't mean you should grab every opportunity. Some opportunities, you say, you know what? Let's, let's pass on that one. But some just accelerate everything. Change the whole game with one play. And you know which of these you are by nature. And you know what? You may be married to a different one. You may be a problem solver married to a goal setter, a goal setter married to an opportunity person. It's like that's a part of the tension you've had in your marriage potentially. Because it's like, why don't you grow up and do it like I do it? Right? You've seen that in couples. You've experienced that in couples. Or you may be saying, no, we're just, just alike. We, we really see things just alike right there. But I'm saying on your team, be aware, whichever of those three you are, you may have someone on your team that's quite different than you are. And once you understand the, the three people and the three differences, then you know who to assign to what. Don't assign you know, a goal setter to an opportunity because they'll just say, well, in the next year or two, we'll get to that, you know, kind of thing. So all three are very valuable. We've had, like you say, presidents of countries in all three. It isn't that one's good and one's bad. And they're all priorities. They're all important areas. And they're all measurable, right? So then what you're asking yourself in the annual plan is in the next quarter, what are the three priorities we need to address in each of those areas. And then in the short range plan, what are the three priorities? There may be three problems we have to fix that, that year. Maybe three goals to reach. Maybe three opportunities and one goal. Or, you know, it's like what that combination is, I don't know. But see it that what are the things we need to focus on, the top three measurable things we need to get done in the next quarter, the next year, the next two years, the next three years. That's your priorities. In the context of which will help reduce the things we're weeping and pounding about in, in alliance with our purpose and each of our objective areas, saying the milestones, the ideas, the, you know, those, seeing all that, in that context, here are the priorities we need to set for next year. In the context of that strategic plan for the next 10 to 50 years, it's like in light of that 10 to 50 years, what are the things we need to do this year to make sure we're moving in that direction?